Uh, let's let's go now. Because uh, if it's like last last week, people will continue to join as as we move through yeah. and and um, and you know the extent to which we can stay on track and meet our timelines. I think there's some value in that. So, <clears throat> uh, with that as my entry point, <clears throat> apologies for that, folks. <clears throat> I'd like to welcome you to the next in the series, uh, uh, winter seminar series that the RA Canoe Camping Club is hosting this this summer winter, I should say. It has been. I wish it was summer. Actually, today when I was just out and walking the dog, I do wish it was summer. Apologize for that slip. Um, the, the winter seminar series this year, we're, we'll be doing upwards of 14, um, and they will all be zoom based and you can find either on our meetup or Facebook or on our website. For those of you who are looking for a, a list of what we're doing, uh, tonight's presentation is, uh, one that I've been looking forward to it as it represents both an opportunity to learn a little bit more about our own local, the local heritage, the local history of the Ottawa area and also provides that, that opportunity for us to perhaps acquire a, a, a little bit of a, an uh, enhanced appreciation of, of the of indigenous culture and specifically the Anishinaabe people who, who for whom have historically called um, or for whom this is their traditional territory. Uh, so next slide please Mark. So very quickly, folks, uh, just as uh, I like to begin all of these discussions by saying, first of all, my name is Steve Dolan. I'm the chair of the RA Camping Club. I'll provide a few more details on that um, later on in the next few slides. Um, Mark, who is a, a past chair and in many ways the, the brains behind this and the energy behind this winter seminar series, uh, will be somebody you will also be meeting through, through our evening together. Very quickly, um, we're a volunteer-based organization, so uh, the one thing I request is a bit of patience. You know, we're doing our best and and trying to um, use the technologies that we have available to to just create an opportunity for us to come together as a community. So the first thing I'd like to note is, um, as in terms of meeting guidelines, is um, over the the next <clears throat> over the fourteen. Um, seminars we're doing, uh, we will be recording some and are and with the permission of the presenters. So smile, you are being recorded. And our intent with that really is to start that process of perhaps building a bit of a library for the club uh, to capture some of the 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 unique value and 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 the moments and the information that um, that arise from this. Um, historically, you know, uh, uh, when I became chair over a year ago, I've heard about these wonderful presentations that have happened in the past and, and um, there are moments in time that in some ways are lost. And so our intent here by building a bit of a library is to, is to create a, something for the, the club moving forward uh, that can be both used uh, by members as well as potentially by instructors to, 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 um, to communicate key information and help with training. All your mics will be muted as you arrive. <clears throat> In today's presentation, we're going to have uh, three specific Q&A sessions. You'll notice them. They'll be very clearly identified in the presentation that's going to be given for to uh, going to be provided to us. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so very quickly, the in 1941, the the RA Center was founded. The RA Center represents one of those gems in the city of Ottawa that provides an opportunity for recreation and leisure covering the whole range of, of, of age groups from youth straight through to seniors. Um, it's a facility that is impressive in terms of the range of activities. There's over 50 member activities that are available of, oh, and, and a whole range of clubs, more than 15 plus clubs of which the, R, the RACC is but one. I've been myself a member of the RA going back and played sports like, you know, um, uh, like soccer and softball and done some cross country skiing. So there's a whole range of activities. I would like to flag because people don't necessar aren't necessarily always aware that they have a, f and they, they, did a, they have typically outside of COVID times, a fairly ambitious um, suite of summer programming that they offer for children, youth and, and teenagers. Uh, next slide, please, Mark. Uh, now, turning, if if the if the RA is a bit of a gem in the city of Ottawa, 
I may be a bit biased, but I think the RACCC is truly a diamond sitting in the city. It is, um, it, it dates back to the, the post-war time frame. We have members of this club whose, whose family who were um, critical to the creation of, of the organization. And uh, one of them who is Dot, whose father was an original founding member. The, the club uh, came in 2012, 2013, moved to the ERA, where we find ourselves today. <clears throat> um, what makes, I think, the ERA CCC and its 175 plus members, um, even in COVID times, which for me is just amazing, um, so valuable is, is the broad suite of, of programs that, that we offer and covering flat water, white water, family programming, sea kayaking. And, and when I talk about programs, I talk about not only providing certified training where all of our trainers are volunteers. Um, and as a consequence, that training is, 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 does not nearly cost as much as if you went to, for, to one of the surrounding outfitters, but we also arrange day, weekend and longer trips. Um, there are also, there is a, we have a, a whole, um, a basically equipment shed that it can includes canoes and a range of other uh, camping based pieces that are available to support um, club based activities. Um, so for those of you who are not members who are, are joining us perhaps for the first time I would highly recommend if, if you're, you're interested to reach out via the our outreach uh, at racc.ca um, email which you'll see identified a couple of times through this presentation. <clears throat> we will be having a virtual open house in uh, towards the end of April, beginning of May. And it really is our intent actually to follow that up sometime in June when, when um, ideally if, if public health uh, regulations allow us to with a, a more of an, uh, an open air uh, sort of um, open house that framed around both not only the shed, but also some of the programs that we offer. So on that note, enough about me, enough of me talking. I'd like to take this opportunity. Uh, oh, sorry, one more thing. So uh, we do care about your opinions. Uh, we really do and actually have been quite valuable. This whole process of going online with our seminars um, is something that we're considering perhaps as, as weaving in as life goes back to normal into, into our winter outreach program moving forward. So any advice you have, both in terms of possibly future topics or feedback about, you know, how we're doing and using the sort of fora would be deeply appreciated. Outreach at raccc.ca is the mechanism by which you can do that. You can also leave comments in the chat function. But with that said, I'd like to, to shift gears momentarily and take the opportunity to welcome uh, Dr. Peter Stockdale, who will be uh, giving today's presentation. Um, and Dr. Peter Stockdale is a researcher and uh, who has among his deep interest in Indigenous matters and Indigenous engagement. Uh, he's been active in developing peace and nature paths in Ottawa. Dr. Stockdale is one of the founding members of Free the Falls, which is dedicated to gathering uh, Grandfather William Commanda's vision to protect the 7,000-year-old Chaudière Falls sacred site, which is found in the heart of Ottawa. Um, and he's also uh, committed to and engaged in the reconciliation process with the Algonquin Anishinaabe, whom, uh, for whom we, we find ourselves in their historical territory here in Ottawa. On that note, I'd like to take this opportunity to say, welcome Dr. Stockdale, and I'll pass the, the microphone metaphorically to you. And um, it was lovely chatting with you. And thank you for coming, Dr. Stockdale. Over to you. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, I'm very, very grateful for your invitation and, and particularly Max uh, in making that, that happen. Um, I, I feel that this is an easy conversation with the Canoe Club and, if, and the first slide tells you why, because uh, you folks are canoeists and you know that this that canoes are from this part of the world and you know that they're indigenous and you know you have to do portages and you have to walk on trails that have been around for thousands of years and many of you know that you know that the Ottawa River is the superhighway between the Atlantic and the Pacific and you know you're at a nexus of rivers between with the Rideau one, on one part of the Ottawa and, and the Gatineau on the other and this is a very 
you know, ancient capital, thousands of years old, and it didn't just start with Victoria. And you, you, you understand that people, uh, whether they they were uh, explorers, the fr French or the English and the Scottish, or the the many many First Nations, came through here and they stayed here and they, as you have have camped you know along the shores and you've you know you you understand the necessities and and the the meaning of what uh what a portage trail means and how it's connected to the the living reality of your lives and you 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 know uh, about the role of the metis and you understand you understand a lot more than most people without without uh you know too much of by your leave so uh, you know i'm really feel very grateful that we're uh i have an opportunity to, for us to be together this, this evening so um mark can we move to the next slide please just one one little comment okay. in the front canoe there the yes. blonde woman with the sunglasses is catherine mckenna right <laughs> yeah and that's another part is that there's connection. There's political connection here, which uh, is easier to do uh, because of the the nature of what you folks have been doing with your canoes and uh, you know, your wisdom also. So, if we could move to uh, the next slide, please, uh, Mark. So. You'll notice it says indigenous trails, not indigenous portage trails, because of course there's the portage and the canoe part, and then there's the rest of it too. And this particular one on your left is the portage, uh, sorry, the the Indian Trail marker, as they call it, um, in the Cole Pinecrest Family Cemetery um, off baseline, and. Uh, one thing that we observed while we were up there is that all of the Cole family and, and is is buried around this marker. And so there's a mystery that we don't, uh, that Max and I have attempted to, to un unpack with the Cole family, but haven't figured out. But this is just one of the, the many uh, mysteries that, uh, that you, know, you become involved with when you start doing this. Uh, this on the right hand side, you will see the trail that goes down towards Britannia. And then, of course, in the course of trying to figure that out, is it down Britannia Road or does it down go down to, towards Mud Creek or Mud, Mud Lake and the creek that comes out there? So, you know, it's it's uh, this this helps introduce you to some of the dilemmas that we um, have to deal with. So next slide, please, Mark. So, uh, just to give you a, a, a tour de raison of the what we've got to uh, what we're likely to be doing this evening. So we have the introduction, how it started is the next one, how many trails, and you can read just as well as I can, and probably faster. And so that give, will give you some idea about what we're going to be doing this evening. So next slide, please. So. Uh, Steve gave us some idea about uh, how it started um, in the sense that, you know, I've been doing trails for a while. I've been part of Free the Falls. We've been doing lots of research and amassing a lot of information, but it's this trail, this immediate trails thing started because of COVID, uh, because I had to get out of the house, had to walk around, had to go walk, in my case, up and down every street in Hindenburg and Westboro. And in the course of that, eventually we hit uh, the Bain Morrison house. Uh, um, and I didn't know that that was the oldest house at 40 Fuller Avenue, but there there it was with its um, plaque and sign. And uh, as it happened, uh, a man was in the uh, street at the time. And I asked him, he, he said, I live here. He's, have lived here. My family have lived here since 1828. Oh, said I. So was, was there an indigenous trail nearby? And I expected him to say, see, uh, we're talking about the previous slide with the one at Pinecrest. And no, he said Sherwood Drive. And 
So I, okay, so I started walking down Sherwood Drive and then it started, I had to try and figure out which, where was it going? And eventually it was clear that it was coming from Dow's Lake and going to Rummick Rapids, but that didn't quite make sense either. So, or, or not alone. So anyway, so it started, it started the journey, if you like, on, on the, this uh, portage uh, and uh, Indigenous Trails journey in this past year. And so we'll move to the next slide, please. So with the help of uh, folks like Dave Alston uh, from Kitchissippi Historian, uh, I started mapping using the uh, Google my maps method and started uh, got doing the, the getting the mapping done getting at least some idea of where things were and this is some of the the longer ones you'll you'll see um in front so i'm down to kingston but the one i brought your attention one is the one to montreal uh, I, again this is a little bit notional but one thing i did know that it went down russell road and so russell road you will notice uh, it goes near where the recently uh, controversial Chewin development goes down. So that uh, development will be along uh, a, an ancient indigenous trail to Montreal. So uh, next slide, please. Um, Peter, while I'm doing this, uh, can you turn up the gain on your microphone a little bit? Uh, some people are having a hard time hearing you. I don't know if I can do that, but I'll try. I think I'm at max. Maybe I'll just, it's saying 100%. So I'll just, you'll have to see more of my face in that case. Um, so excuse for the uh, large white moon in front of you. That will be me. But anyway, so uh, the next slide, I'm not asking for a change, trail evidence. So where do we get the evidence for the, this? Largely, it comes out of various settler accounts, either written or maps. We have the, and one of those maps is the 1830 Swalwell uh, uh, map, which it, it gives you some very detailed, uh, you know, block by block, uh, mapping where some of them are, are rather vague. And so it's, but we do also get from indigenous people or even some uh, from just trying to figure it out from, you know, little scraps of information that we might, might get. Um, some of it's a little bit more speculative, but most of the 20 plus that we've got so far are, are not speculative. Max, is there anything you'd like to say well, just on this map, you can see the faint dotted lines running uh, from the Rideau, possibly around Black Rapids over to uh, um, Shirley's Bay. And then farther down, there's another dotted line as you're coming into downtown Ottawa that runs from the Rideau over to the Ottawa. So those dotted lines conjecturally um, <laughs> in 1830 are, are roads or trails that were built that probably followed the trails that were already there. Um, it does make some sense um, if you want to go from the Rideau to the Ottawa and end up above all the rapids. Well, you would cut the shortest straight line is, is Black Rapids, which was a very long, shallow set of rapids before the canal uh, to Shirley's Bay. It's only about five kilometers as the crow flies, um, not, you know, and it's flat. And it's interesting, <laughs> and I won't go on too long, but when we were doing the uh, 2017 sesquicentennial and we're meeting the brigade coming down the Ottawa, they wanted to paddle in with us the last stretch. So they actually portaged from Shirley's Bay to Black Rapids. Um, they portaged by road, but that's the route they took because it was the shortest line. So it's just kind of, oh yeah, well that makes sense. That where the, is where the portage probably would have gone. Hmm. Right. So right uh, through Pinecrest Cemetery, <laughs> where the mysterious stone marker is. Exactly. Uh, 
Okay, so um, next slide, please. Now we get the first opportunity for asking questions with uh, a few points talking about where we are, you know, where, what we've been through. Well, um, Peter, I don't know if you raised this, but there's a whole lot of reasons for a trail and uh, portage doesn't just have to avoid some, you know, nasty water or shallow water. Uh, like you pointed out, it can go to a fishing area, it can go to a community, it can mm -hmm. go to your girlfriend's, you know, house. No, I have those the later on the slides. To have oh. a portage. It's not just to avoid, um, you know, rapids or falls. Indeed. So if okay. anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to either type them in the chat room or to virtually raise your hand, whatever you're more comfortable with. And if we don't have any questions, then I guess we can move. Do we have anything? If not, then we can move to the uh, next part of the conversation, I guess. Peter, we're, we're good for the moment. Ch just check the chat as well. There's nothing. Right. Okay. So there are different types, as Max has said, uh, and some of them are between the rivers and some of them show, uh, you know, that the <laughs> evidence of archaeology that people have been there for thousands of years. And I, you know, if you look at the left slide there, we're at Governor Bay below the Governor General's looking towards the Gatineau River and the uh, Lady Aberdeen Spire, which, um, as you may know, has a uh, Abiwin place which, uh, where 7,000 years of archaeology has been found with evidence, as we often find in this area of people coming from Labrador, Lake Superior, James Bay, uh, and um, I think Illinois in this particular case. But you see this regular pattern of incredible movement of about people over long periods of time, time, you know, going distances of 2000 kilometers plus to get here. Um, and so there's a, a vast history that we are involved in, not just being here, but talking about the, these trails. And on the right hand side, uh, you'll see Max going up the steps, uh, which goes through the Governor General's. And this, we figure, is the trail from Governor Bay up to the Rideau, which has been obviously um, improved, shall we say, or put into, wood, into uh, rock, rock steps anyhow, up to uh, the uh, up to the Rideau Canatwell Ken River. Thank you. Okay. Well, you always, has, sorry, I'm putting it again. It's okay. When you're looking for possible portage routes and you always have to look at the Ottawa and the Rideau in both cases, the water level has been raised by dams um, at Governor's Bay, maybe about three feet. And if you dig through the, the muck a bit, it's all sand underneath and very likely when it was at its pre dam level, this was a beautiful sandy beach at Governor's Bay. Also the only place where there aren't cliffs. Um, likewise, the Rito has been raised a few feet by the dam just above the falls. And again, you have to kind of try and picture the river at its original water level and where it would be a logical spot to, to get, take out your canoe before you scratch it to pieces on the rocks. Um, so yeah, that, that portage seemed to us pretty obvious, actually. That was a, just a natural carry route. And this has been the work that we've been doing over the last half a dozen months um, as a group. Uh, so Max and John Savage and, and uh, Catherine Machot and Jason Downlocky and, uh, and I wandering around in the summer or this or the snow trying to figure out where these trails went and uh it, you know so frankly it's a whole lot of fun next slide
Thank you. And this one is a more, is an interesting one between Richmond Landing uh, and the, and Richmond, the town. And uh, the first thing that I knew about it is there, that there was, it was for uh, ex soldiers. That's what I, that was what I understood the trail to be about. Uh, but, uh, oh, and you see Max there on the right hand side. Uh, and, but it, there's a bigger story. And we'd always heard that the por only portage was on the other side of the river uh, near Chaudière Falls and that it went along the right hand side. But it, had, it emerged that there was this trail on the uh, Ontario side, as it is now, and that uh, it goes all the way down Richmond Road, Wellington Richmond Road, and eventually reach the Jock River, uh, which probably for the indigenous folks may have ended the trip, um, at least as a foot activity. But uh, for settlers, it also went all the way down to the and as far as you can go down the Jock. So um, it was a, a mixture. And what was also curious about this one is that it went very far inland um, and curves down and uh, in a in a, an ellipse, in an unusual shape, which I still haven't figured out. But anyway, next slide, please. And there are different other types of tra trails. This is one something I've uh, a, a term I have created called a portage of avoidance. Um, there's been. Uh, this may be one of the oldest trails. This may be, this would, certainly would have been a part of the territory that besides the Gatineau Hills would have started to emerge first after the Champlain was starting to uh, appear. And this is uh, where Chemin de la Montagne is and Lake Mountains, and you're looking at uh, Lake Mountains there. And it's a portage of avoidance because it, it, it was described that this was the route, one of the routes that were taken uh, to avoid attack by the Mohawk folks at uh, and around um, Chaudière and the University of Quebec de Lutte, depending on who, who you're reading. So there was a, a, a portage going high into the, just before you hit the uh, Gatineau Hills and then down, as you see on the right, the rather green looking uh, Breckenridge Creek. Next slide, please. And then there are other kinds of tra trails as well. On your left, you'll see um, the Ottawa River at uh, in the winter solstice, and that is uh, Victoria Island. Look, uh, looking you're looking at um, there, and this is from where? This is from Parliament Hill. But before it was Parliament Hill, it was a place for uh, viewing uh, solstices, uh, winter and, and summer. And there seems to be something based on me going up, <laughs> looking at these rivers, whether the Gatineau or the Ottawa and around the hills, there's something about the, the sun reflecting in the water that seemed to be important in these, this uh, ritual, as far as I can make out, primitive as I am. Anyway, so on the right hand side, you will see uh, the Women's Gathering Rock. And this is out near Maberly, Ontario. Um, and this is where uh, there is also a men's gathering rock, a, a counterpart, but this is the women's one. And this is where uh, women would come uh, to learn, I guess, the, the exchanges of, of information there. It reminds me of the Areopagus in Athens in that way, but um, this is the the counterpart here, and the trail weaves around it. You know, so it's very it's all about the rock, and um, so inter it's interesting uh, in that way. So, uh, sorry, it's ahead, interesting Mark. also. That there's a in Ireland, there's an analogous women's gathering rock, 
No, I don't know that uh, one. For very same purpose, exchange of medicinal information. Hmm. And uh, yeah, <laughs> so, so yeah, very interesting. That was used like right up until like well into this century, traditionally women hmm. from the farms would I don't know if it was solstice, I'm not Irish, um, but still, it sounds a very, very similar purpose. Uh, Dot has a question, we'll hold it till the next break, Dot, it'll only be in a few minutes. Okay. Um, all right, so next slide, please. And then you get these trails, which are very much a, a combination of different things, portage, hunting, fishing, ritual, and here we have the case of Remic Rapids, where the stromatolites are, if you know about the stra stromatolites, which are very important in themselves. But this is where the Sherwood uh, Drive uh, goes to. It, it goes, hits the bottom of Island Park Drive, and you can, I think, see the remnant of that in the weird shape of the very bottom of Island Park Drive. And then across the river, you get this, which um, I'm pretty sure is a um, a fishing weir, um, and I think those rocks are also used for har harpooning those single single rocks. But the uh, you get a good hint because the the ducks and the egrets and the herons are still using them now, even if you don't see humans um, using it. And it may be, and I haven't quite figured out, this may be a serpent shape. If you can see, it's rather sinusoidal. Um, so that, that's something, there's definitely something serious going on there. A lot of effort has been gone for that particular location. Um, next slide, please. So other considerations. So as I mentioned earlier uh, regarding the portage of avoidance, the draining of the Champlain C is an important part of uh, trying to understand the porta the the roots in this place because the portages have had to, to change or the roots have had to change as uh, as the water has dropped down and particularly between uh, eight thousand years ago nine thousand years ago and seven thousand years ago which is about where we're at right now so you get a whole lot of roots that uh follow the 8000 year 8 to 9000 year uh route and others which are definitely just related to the water current water levels and then to, uh, next the next point is that you know some of them are land waters uh, routes and some of them are water routes and some are for, for boats and more modern in that respect uh, you know and some are just for for foot travel and some are for canoes and also the routes change depending on what the water levels are and snow and, and you know so there's a, there's a whole lot of different considerations so uh, I think um, it makes a whole, it's easier for you folks to understand that it might be for folks who are used to uh, roads and the, the roads are relatively speaking quite fixed and understood uh, as, um, you know, they're always going to, Richmond Road will always look like Richmond Road and it won't change a whole lot, you know, one time at the part of the year to the next and, you know, one year to the next. Um, so, and then there were lots of different sub routes that were optional um, to, to take into account. And the purpose of them may be different. Some of these routes were for example around the falls a lot of them were concerned with negotiation some of them were related to uh to war some were related to trade you know, to think of the morrison island and alamette island up, up river was all about uh trade and now i hear my earphones going again uh and some are about food gathering there's this is a, a, a very wealthy place this part of um uh, the, the world with its eels and its acorns and its butternut and it, its sugar maples. It's a very rich place. Uh, and some of these are for lookouts. So, so there are specific trails for 
to get up to lookouts so you can uh, do a uh, good observation. And some of them are for visiting families or for visiting, as Mike said, girlfriends or friends or, or powwow. So they, they have different purposes. Um, next slide. Okay, so here we are, the question break. And so I will uh, answer. So, okay. Can we unmute Dot for her question? So Dot, did you want to unmute yourself? Oh, well, I think I did it. <laughs> yeah, uh, what was my question? I think it was around, so Peter, where, is, where are you getting this information other than meandering around, <laughs> wandering around Ottawa, et cetera? Where are you getting information to tell you, for example, that uh, the Mohawks, uh, would use the alternate route to, uh, not the Mohawks, so Ojibwe, or Al Algonquins would use the other route to uh, avoid the Mohawks. How do we know those people were there? Well, uh, partic well, th there's a lot of different kinds of e evidence um, for that particular trail that I, that I showed you before. Yeah. Uh, if, uh, if there's quite a lot of information coming out of Edwin Souter from about 1900. Um, and uh, he specifically talks about uh, uh, vo avoidance of the Mohawks along that route um, uh, from Lac Limi going up. There are others, you know, a much more circuitous route from the Rouge River uh, in order to avoid an attack. And there are, uh, you can see it also in the architecture of the trails to, um, for example, the, the Sherwood Drive one, which I told you about behind the, the oldest house in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. uh, un, unlike many uh, trails around the world, usually you'll see people going along ridge lines in, in order to, for visibility, for you know display or whatever it is. The Sherwood Drive one is peculiar in that it's pretty near Chaudière. Uh, it's coming from Dow's Lake, but it's down in a, in a dell, you're trying to avoid to visibility. That's my speculation. You're Anyhow, okay. you're hiding exactly. Yeah. And, and there are other ones where you, uh, some of these these pathways look. They're going way. Uh, uh, th there seems to be an avoidance of Chaudière, where in many respects, as we discussed at the beginning, you know, this is the the nexus. This is the meeting place. This is the place yeah. of negotiation and also food gathering. So why would you have all of those trails doing exactly the opposite of that? Um, it's anyway, so there's various bits of ev evidence on that matter. Okay. Uh, there is a question, Peter, about the actual location of the Women's Gathering Rock. Maybe we can um, uh, send that out like on uh, a, an hour I, or something. I, um, I, have a pretty good idea about that. Um, I have located it. I, it's doesn't. It's not. You know, it doesn't really have a. Uh, a it hasn't been memorialized. Uh, you can see it. Um, it. It's out near Moberly, Ontario. It's on the um, Highland Line. It's called. Um, although it's an indigenous trail from what I'm, I have been told. Um, I'm a little bit um, wary of being too precise because this was uh, given to me by a, an indigenous uh, Algonquin and Anishinaabe Kwe who want, wants to memorialize it. So, um, and so I am slightly, um, yeah, I would want to talk with, with Joe to find out, you know, <laughs> because there is a history, of course, uh, of, and this is one of the reasons that Indigenous people are loath to tell us very much about them, because uh, as happened with the, the pipelines in Standing Rock, you know, uh, they said, well, we don't know where, this is the pipeline folks said, well, we don't know where your sacred sites are. And so then they said, okay, here they are on the maps, etc. And then they were bulldozed. Um, this may be 
a little bit harder to bulldoze, but you can, anyway, so I don't want to, uh, I, I want to, I have to consult is what I'm saying for me to be too precise. I've given you an, a general I, uh, idea, um, but uh, Lynn, I'd be happy to get back to you. Um, I see. Perhaps we can choose a pot in Ottawa to identify as our own. Now, um, do you mean per, uh, as your personal uh, spot, or are you talking about as the uh, yeah, canoe club? It, yeah, it's Dodd here. I was thinking I'd really like the idea of a place where women would gather on purpose. And um, so maybe we don't, uh, um, out of respect for one that's um, ancient and perhaps should be not well known, that mm -hmm. maybe we can choose one. Uh, this is a good way out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is a good way out. Diana yeah. Beresford Kruger, who lives near Kempville, uh, the woman who talks to trees, she did a documentary. Uh, she's Irish and knows about women's gathering rocks in Ireland, so um, she's local-ish, should be easy to contact. Um, there is a question about uh, other uh, Champlain's journals. Oh yes, when Champlain went up the Ottawa, um, yes. he did He did a portage of avoidance, um, taking the route uh, through a few lakes and then the Muskrat River all the way down to the Ottawa except he didn't quite go all the way there. Um, it gets a little confusing when you read into his journals and what's going on. So it seemed his guides wanted to avoid the Tessuat because he collects the duties. He kind of controlled the river on the islands just below Pembroke. And as they're doing the portage around that, they changed their mind and walked actually right to him overland because I think Champlain really wanted to talk to him because he was the big chief and Champlain was a politician as well as an explorer. Um, the explorer. It's a classic portage of avoidance, not so much to avoid the big rapids on the Ottawa, because uh, um, they're all quite easily portageable. It's a whole lot easier to go up the main or middle channel than to do this 13 miles to Curtis route through little lakes and swamps and a messy little creek mm. until it finally gets enough water below Muskrat Lake to actually paddle it. Um, a classic portage of avoidance. I think the Algonquin were also keen to prevent uh, too far, too much penetration into their territory. So they were kind of, stay back, please, uh, you know. Well, sometimes yeah. I think, too, the guides have their own agendas. Right, exactly. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> like they may not be taking you the best route, or they may say, let's take him the hardest route, and he probably <laughs> won't ever come back. Mm. Okay. Um, so, uh, so, Peter, there's one, Dr. Stockdale, there was one more question, uh, and it's from Hartley, who suggested, who was wondering if you had looked at the Hudson Bay Company documentation on Portage Trails, specifically those that relate to the fur trade and the beaver wars. Not at all. No, I mean, I have not. It would be relevant to our local situation here. Okay. Okay, not at all. So, thank you for that uh, useful hint shall we say. Thank you. Okay, so next slide, please. Um, there's also just a, another one from uh, Jim Stone. Okay. It says that Eric Morris identifies long east-west avoidance routes through the headwaters of the Ottawa River and Yatton River. Oh yeah, Jim, that's a, that's a heck of a, of a route of avoidance, but I mean, as I understand the route, uh, one of the routes, because there's a lot, was up the Des Moines and across sort of through what's now Laverandri Park, heading east, so you're way above the Ottawa, way, way far away. And then coming, going either down the Rouge back to the Ottawa, or you could go still farther and come down the Saint Maurice River to Trois Rivières, um, to all to avoid attacks by the Iroquois at that time. So, I mean, these, these are monumental canoe trips. <laughs> That's just, uh, um, but yeah, you know, you're taking uh, your furs to Trois-Rivières or Montreal, but probably Trois-Rivières would be easier at that point once you're way up there and get into the San Luis. So, uh, yeah, I know. Although the Iroquois also penetrated all the way up to James Bay, as Jim knows well. Um, 
So the uh, uh, certainly gives you an idea how much uh, fear and worry <laughs> the uh, oh. Mohawks and Haudenosaunee generally ca caused in this part of the country. Um, it's quite remarkable. Um, so uh, next, they we're on to that next slide. So why why am I doing this? You've all know, been part of, of Free, the, Free the Falls. And, and so what I want to do is help change the narrative for Ottawa and, and for us to see uh, the nature beneath the concrete. And I know you folks as, as canoeists, you, you, you do that because of exactly what you're doing when you're canoeing. And, and it's part of the decolonization process. Um, and, and so that's my hope is that this, this uh, revitalization or this consideration of, of these trails will be, will help us to, to uh, as a, a capital and as a, a people, get closer to um, indigenous views of things and get us closer to nature. And maybe it will help us a little bit in trying to uh, avoid the extinction that is coming at us pretty fast. So in this modest proposal, then so how do we how do we do that? Um, it's about revitalization, and how do we do that? We do it through. Or do we do a full trail revitalization or a partial trail revitalization? There's a whole lot of concrete that's come in between. That you know, you you can't just walk as the crow flies uh, any anymore in some of these. Some you still can, uh, as we've discussed. You know, do you want to do landscaping? How much signage do you, you need to, to make it real? Um, but I think one of the things that I learned during the COVID times is that you, uh, we don't want to just take trips to go to the Dollarama or the, the uh, superstore, you know, or the gas station as the case may be. You know, we, we might want to have some meaning in, in our lives uh, and maybe this, these trails are, are part of doing that. And, you know, in, in order to do that efficiently in these days, as most of us are, are not used to traveling as the, the uh, uh, Coeur de Bois and the uh, voyageur and indigenous folks going for many, many, many kilometers on foot. Uh, we may have to do uh, things by, with canoes, of course, but bikes and, and scooters. But before we, we get to that, we have to have a, a good idea about uh, mapping. And so, but we can also consider uh, uh, we're in the digital world now. Do we want this to be gaming? There are already uh, things like Driftscape and all trails applications with their 100,000 trails and the digital museum. We can do virtual reality if we want to. Next slide, please. And here's one of them. Here's the Driftscape application that you can get on your phone. And they already, in Toronto, have a number of different indigenous trails identified in this particular case along the Humber. And uh, so it's, and on the right hand side, you'll see uh, the, what that looks like. They've got a little marker and they've got some plaques and you'll see on the right hand side, plaque number one of three. And you can, you know, there has been, there is now already, um, there are already means to, um, do this mapping and visiting and, and you know tourism if you want to put it that way of this uh, of these trails um, I haven't seen a counterpart in the all trails thing it, it's much more of a, uh, well related to uh, more like a hiking trekking thing from what I, I have seen so far so next slide please 
the federal government through the uh, Museum of History has a uh, facility called uh, which uh, called the Digital Museum, which has community stories, uh, uh, and and they have a, a wide variety of uh, little websites, essentially with little stories uh, about um, different things, including uh, portage trails, uh, but many other other matters too. But it gives you. But this is a a, a facility uh, that might be used um, in order to get uh, the um, development of these trails from a digital perspective happening. Next slide, please. Oh, gone too far. Okay, there we are. Okay, so I've given you some idea that we are, have been doing some research and we're, we're meeting and we're sending messages to each other and we go out for our trail investigations and I've been doing the, my trail mapping so far. Um, the state of Ottawa ha is, has their own process that um, seems to be coincident with this, which is they're changing their, their sign and Indigenous commemoration policies right now. They also have the Reconciliation Action Plan. I've had uh, conversations with Pequotnigan First Nation and Kitigan Zibi uh, First Nation. Pequotnigan is, is the most uh, directly interested so far, which is particularly important as they seem to be are, are more connected to the city of Ottawa and more theoretically related to the Ontario side of, of the of the equation. There's also a national and municipal conversation that's just beginning between different coordinators doing action plans uh, in different cities. And so they're starting to have that kind of, because um, they know that this is happening in Toronto, has already happened in Toronto. This is seems to be happening with us in Ottawa. It's so, of course, there are trails all over the place. So that, is a network that may emerge here. And um, as a result of some of my uh, work, uh, the gathering of information that I've been doing, um, I'm connected with uh, a company called Commonwealth Heritage Resource Management. And they have done uh, for the NCC um, a, a study of the uh, uh, little uh, Chaudière, Petit Chaudière in front of Tani's pasture uh, near Bac Musset, uh, that uh, second, uh, pass second um, portage route. And, uh, and they were funded as well for some of, some of that. Uh, um, in other words, things happened <laughs> as a result of that. So there is, if you like, some uh, experience bes besides ourselves in doing some of this um, portage uh, and trail commemoration. So we're not starting from from zero, in other words. So yeah. now, go ahead, Max. Oh uh, yeah, like there's some of some of the low low hanging fruit, like the portage around the Chaudière. I mean, and there's more than one. There's probably both sides of the river, but you know the fur trade route that the Voyageur Portage we know was kind of down Eddy Street and Hall. Um, we know there's Portage around the Little Chaudière that ends up in Carchet Brebeuf Park and starts, um, depending how you interpret it, either at the end of what could be called Squaw Bay, it's, you know, on the, uh, in Gatineau, or right at the mouth of Squaw Bay. And it was commemorated actually by a brass plaque that got stolen <laughs> some years ago, uh, right. but we know that we know the portage around Duchenne went on the Quebec side, and in fact there was once a canal there, and you could, you know that was used for some years to uh, probably with a lock to get the fur trade canoes around the Duchenne Rapids, and you can still see parts of that ditch still there. Um, it's a canoe-sized ditch, so I mean there's some low-hanging fruit that make really interesting stories, but they're not commemorated at all, like mm -hmm. nothing. They could even street signs, you know, there's so much you could easily do. Um, 
And I think know, this is one of the things that, that I have learned from watching because the, those portages have been memorialized since 1927. Uh, and yet the, the portage memorialization, the, the signs, et cetera, have been disappeared and ripped off and turned into from uh, roots, turned into events um, within the, the, by the NCC. In other words, there are, there is information, there is knowledge there that uh, needs to be uh, preserved and perhaps the digital medium, medium uh, tenuous as it is, also has a way of being more resistant uh, to um, changing fashions and, and um, well, knowledge as it changes, shall we say. So I, I think this is a, a, one of the key things to, to learn that um, we have an opportunity here to um, develop uh, a, a fund of information which will be useful to canoeists, trekkers, historians, archaeologists, um, the Algonquin, every, you know, a whole lot of different takes on it anyway, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So now we're moving to the next slide, please, if, we are, if you're ready, Max. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the initial project. So this is uh, something that I have, have come up with and I don't put it in stone or anything like that, but certainly to think about anyhow. Um, between Mooney's Bay um, through Lemieux Island where the water filtration plant is uh, down uh, and over to Remick and for and I've identified uh, because Mooney's Bay is where Mooney's Bay is, um, is that the Rideau Canoe Club might be interested in something like that, but I have not spoken to them, but it, it, it occurs to me as a, an obvious partner um, for part of that. Um, and then there is uh, the uh, first and second um, portage between Hull and uh, the and Little Chaudière, the third one to descend may be more of a challenge, but uh, certainly should be done sooner or later. Um, and then there is uh, the uh, likely me to Chaudière Falls, which uh, Max and Dot and, and I and uh, Kokum Jane Chatra and many others uh, uh, pa uh, paddled um, two, was it two summers ago now. Um, that's a, an easy one that doesn't really, which can, can, can be done at any, any time without uh, any memorialization, but uh, could well be uh, memorialized and formalized in some manner also. And then, uh, as we saw at the beginning of the presentation, uh, Governor Bay to uh, the Rideau, because uh, that's all within the NCC, uh, Volley, if you like, they they uh, so it's there's not uh, it's it's not difficult. The only piece that's a little bit difficult is it goes through the governor general's grounds up those steps, uh, and there's a um, fence uh, and some difficulty near that. It looks shook, but not not insuperable. I wouldn't wouldn't think. So uh, the next slide, unless you have anything. Okay, so what do we have to do? We have to start creating partnerships. And I've started that with the conversations with Pigwaknagon and Kitty Ganzibi. There's a whole lot more that needs to be do done. There's uh, how do we relate to the settler govern governments, whether they're federal or, or municipal or provincial. Um, and then there are other indigenous folks, whether they're Métis or urban indigenous people who are logical partners, especially the, the Métis, because uh, the um, uh, Algonquin particularly were uh, pushed off the river and pushed up to Pequot, Nagan and, and Kitty Ganzibi by, by settlers. 
So it's the, the, there's a lot of Métis knowledge because they were allowed, you know, they were allowed to use the, the river. Uh, and now, of course, there, uh, there are a huge number, 40 to 80,000 indigenous people in, in Ottawa, Gatineau. So uh, that's an obvious partnership too. And we have to develop teams if we're going to do this effectively. Um, and uh, it may require multiple teams doing different things. Um, and which means, of course, we need proposals. And then there's the question of groups and which groups and which projects we're going to do. And I mentioned the National Trail Network. I mentioned two and those, those are some considerations, but I won't go into them uh, at this point. And so next slide, please. So in order to create these partnerships, we need to identify the different communities. And there are the, the water sports folks uh, like yourselves, but of course there's not just canoers, there's kayakers and scholars and, and so on uh, and so forth. And one of them, next slide, is uh, whitewater rafters. And those folks, as uh, I mentioned, end up at the Onigam, the portage, uh, next to Lemieux Island. So they're a logical group to engage in too. And the next slide, please. Here, I'll just interject here just for a second because sure. um, because business is good. Uh, like I, I did tours for the Thousand Islands Boat Museum last summer in big canoes in Gananoque. We also worked on uh, the interpretive messaging that would come out in these tours. We have the tours in the Thousand Islands. But as I look at Gananoque, uh, from a geographical context, it seems to be a lot of water flows. If you want to go from Ottawa, from the Ottawa River near Ottawa to the St. Lawrence, you'd end up in Gananoque. Whether you went by the Rideau, in which the first surveyors of the Rideau Canal were taken, up the Rideau and down the Gananoque River. It took, you know, Colonel By wanted to go to Kingston, but nobody else did. That was a military decision. <laughs> exactly. uh, and, uh, but then you look at a shorter route. That's kind of a circuitous route. I mean, it's the main water flow. But, in, uh, but there are shorter routes, like through Irish Lake and Irish Creek, which hits Cerrito just you know, below Smith Falls. There's even a shorter route if you just, well, I don't want to get into too many details, but almost from uh, up the Gananoque River and cross into the uh, Kempville Creek. Mm. It's a, you can spit from one watershed to the other, <laughs> and that takes you. It's then you hit the Rideau at Kempville, and you're in Ottawa like in no time. Which this is, a, I'll put that invitation out if anybody wants to explore that route this spring when the water's high. I'm in. Mm. <laughs> great. And, um, but what it adds up to is a great interpretive message for the business, uh, you know, the Thousand Islands Boat Museum. If, mm. Again, Rockley all of a sudden takes on a whole different significance. It's not an industrial town, which it was in its kind of glory days. It's not just a tourist town, which it is today. It was a meeting place. Mm. It's where the waters met. So it takes on a whole different message. And, and that whole different messaging that you get through doing the investigations that you're doing, Peter, I think is where the real significance lies. Mm. We see the land in a totally from a totally different perspective, and that's the key thing. Yeah, exactly. So, other folks who are part of this are the the hikers and, and walkers because they're uh, walking along the these indigenous trails, whether they know it or, or not, um, and they're also interested in hiking and walking and having interpretive signs and and you know, having something uh, beautiful to do on, on the weekend. And so how do we get those folks engaged? Uh, next slide, please. And then there's the, the little uh, means of conveyance, the bikes and the scooters that, we, that could be engaged in this kind of activity. I'm thinking particularly between um, Mooney's Bay and um, Lemieux. Um, island. Uh, next slide, please. 
And then there are the archaeologists and the historians uh, that are interested in this. And, partic and I uh, put this one particularly because when I was talking with Pequoknagon First Nation at Golden Lake, they were saying they want to start uh, and create a school of archaeology for their youth. They want, want to uh, have their own uh, youth doing the, the archaeology. And frankly, I can't blame them because we put so much of their uh, um, archaeology, their history under the blade and, and wiped it out. So I, I can see why they would want to, to do that themselves. Um, but it also cr helps uh, cr recreate the, and rediscover uh, their, their, their own history and, and stories. Um, so, th but that's a really exciting uh, possibility that can come uh, from partnership with Pequotnikon, from from what I, I can make out. And since I wanted to be a, an archaeologist since I was eight, can you believe that? But it's true. Um, you know, this turns my crank, if I may put it that way. So, um, thinking the trails out. The next slide, please. So, scope. You know, how do we want to be focusing just on Ottawa Gatineau, just on Ottawa? Do we want to be going uh, much further afield? Uh, Max's uh, friend Jim uh, Stone ha has uh, discovered a, a series of maps that go way up upriver showing portage, portages. So how do we do do this? Is this a, a, a you know, what, what sort of, how do we do this? And then there, as we've seen in some of the preceding slides, there are different takes on what the slide, the trails mean from an Algonquin and Anishinaabe perspective, from a canoe's perspective, from a trekkers, historians, archeologists, businesses, they all have their own views on this. And something that I, I have, I noticed, particularly when I saw the all trails site was that it was very efficient, but it was also very narrow. And so the, the whole scope of what these trails mean and what they, you know, all, they're all their, their more total history and their more, more total reality is not represented. And so I'm keen uh, for us not to do, uh, you know, just an app, which is just gonna show walking trails and say just, and show just that's about it. They won't show any ambiguity. Maybe the trail went this way or that way. In other words, I'm keen to preserve and uh, protect as much of the knowledge about these trails as we can manage. So that's the key piece piece for me. But then how do you do that? Okay, so the level of the mapping and organization. So is it gonna be done by the city of Ottawa? Is it gonna be done by the province of Ontario or Quebec? Is it gonna be done um, by the, the uh, geological survey. How is this actually going to happen? Who's going to be doing the, the, the real mapping and the, and the preservation of this? Does it go, do we have to create or can we use existing um, nonprofits to uh, create the fund of information so that it can be licensed out to different folks with different interests, like so? Canoeists may be keen on the canoe route per se, but they may be less keen on, on knowing the rest of it. Uh, so they may want to, uh, you folks may want to be more interested in, in that slice of things and, and historians and archeologists may be more keen on other slices. So there are different ways of trying to, to think this out. And I won't say that I've thought it, thought it out completely, but um, we're starting to get there. Next slide. So that, that is essentially the end hooray uh, of the presentation per se, but we have you know some more discussion to, to come to at this point. And so um, I guess um, before we come out to uh, open it up for a complete uh, chattable discussion, there are a few messages uh, to deal with. I see one from, see one from Philippe have I thought of putting some of my findings up on Wikipedia? Uh, not until you uh, asked me to, Philippe. No, I haven't. Uh, but I certainly think it's a good idea. Um, a very good I I idea. 
And uh, John, I, I definitely agree we need an historical wiki for this area. And having attempted to do that for Chaudière Falls and then getting it undone, perhaps maybe a little bit, um, uh, you know, without getting controversial in my statements, in a, you know, slightly suspicious about the wikiness of it all. Uh, and uh, thank you, Hartley. Uh, well, okay. one thing we could go, uh, where so one idea two. is, is right. with the canoe the club. The larger network will attract people from outside Ottawa to the project. Uh, I think it's, it's true. Um, so I see Heather is loving to do a walking tour of some of these trails. Okay, well, actually, that you can find the Pinecrest one on online. It was real, it's still not the easiest, but if you look at my uh, Facebook, uh, I, there are, I, I make sure that there are a number of hints in there, uh, which should give you a, a good idea. Um, it's actually the older, yeah, uh, well, anyway, we can get that one sorted out if you'd like, Heather. So, uh, Matt. Max, there's a question for you from Kathy. Yeah, but the whole is kind of a theme for- um... uh, She'd be interested in the Irish Creek exploration, I see she's saying. Oh, and Philippe is offering to write the articles. Okay, well, that would be awesome. Uh, okay, Heather, so uh, now we're going to have a discussion. So we're going to open the mics up if you have other things you want, would like to say. Um, it, it's so, Mark. Uh, Mark, are we able to do that? Okay, um, uh, uh, just a bit of information in the question. Um, I'm going to be doing a, a summary of the presentation. Thank you. Um, and, and I'll be running by Dr. Stockdale first. I'll be on the website. Um, two questions. Um, one is, you know, you were talking about getting people and organizations involved. Um, how do people do that? And if there is a way to do so, I'll include it in the article so people don't have to jot notes madly tonight. And second question is, uh, is there any thought of organizing walks on the portages just as a, a public outing? I think we can go a little farther than just organizing walks. I think it kind of, there's a, a theme here for club outings, like the Irish Creek route, which hasn't even come up as a, as a, it would make a fine club outing uh, from uh, the Rideau to Irish Lake, which is halfway to halfway to get you to Gananoque. You don't have to do the horrendous portage out of Irish Lake to get over to the Gananoque River watershed, but it gives you an idea of the route. And there could be other club outings that would look at Indigenous trails, Indigenous portages, Indigenous uh, routes. So that that's that's an easy one. You know, the Irish Creek one, quite enjoyable. Um, anyhow, just throw that out as as a theme. I would just sort of note, like the COVID limitations at this point. We've had groups of you know our right. five in our in our group, and we haven't grown it bigger than that. Um, it, it would require, if you like, a you know other porta other uh, for us not to have multiples of five, something like that, depending on how we we do it. Um, but it's certainly even within those restrictions, still technically uh, possible to to do that. And um, what maybe you could help us with, Peter, would be some sort of data gathering. Um, you know, not a form, but just. What data, if, if we are trying to retrace a route, explore a route, what data do you want us to bring back that we could get through, you know, mm -hmm. documentation, photography, video, stuff like that? Sure. Well, part of it, of course, is, is whatever paper we can gather from historical records yeah. um, or accounts. Um, some of the, like I came across the chap whose family had been there for since 1828, not, not a whole lot of those folks, but they they do exist because I came, I know because I found one, um, and then of course the indigenous folks um, who may have some some of that knowledge too, um, 
and also just the the practice the practice of doing that and being there as a canoeist you know what does work what doesn't work mm -hmm. and and that's necessary not just for the trying to work out the historical route but from the point of view of the revitalization of that because you know it may be great that it was portageable in 1759 but if you can't do it today then it, it's not useful for from a, a canoeist point of view from today um so you know we need 1759 or 1820 but we also need if we're really interested in revitalizing those trails um the knowledge from today and what works and who's involved and you know the landowners and all of that kind of thing okay um so are there other questions that we're seeing we're able okay so Catherine is saying there's an old club route there um let me just see what else we've got here um okay so let me just move to the next slide please So uh, we are seeking volunteers and you can contact uh, me or, or Max or other members of the group, Mike, uh, Mike John Savage or Catherine Majo or Jason Donaki, uh, Donaki if you know, know them, or I guess in the, in the interim, uh, sorry, Mark, to uh, contact Mark in order to contact us. Um, and uh, so, what do we need volunteers for? We need people around organizing events because we're going to have to do some sort of launch and some sort of attempted revitalization. And we're going to have to communicate about that. We need to do the mapping itself. We need to determine those trails. As we discussed, we need to project, develop the projects. We need to figure out who, what kinds of partners we can bring into the, whether they're the businesses of the city or the, the feds, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and we need to the the knowledge which you're helping us to with tonight, for example, uh, 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 and the thinking about like the wiki, for example, and uh, you know the description of the club route for, uh, description for Irish Creek uh, as an example. You know we need we need all all of that in order for us to move this this forward um, and and make it happen in a, a more real way but uh so uh next slide uh mark right questions and comments are there any more questions and comments you can raise a hand or submit questions or just contact information okay all right um all right so um to, uh, to save a bit of effort in mad scribbling um, Thank you. I'm going to be posting uh, an article about uh, tonight's presentation on the uh, public part of the Canoe Club website and on our Facebook site. And so as part of the article, I'll get uh, uh, Dr. Stockdale to submit some contact information for me. And it'll be on the article there. Thank you. Okay. So there we are. Are there any further questions or comments? I see we're at 8.21. Did we miss anything else? Don't think so. Okay. I hear silence. I see silence. I hear silence. 